Take a seat. Go ahead and take a seat. You know, Tom asked me uh, a couple days ago to lead kind of an extended time of prayer in our service this morning. I've been looking forward to it ever since. So we're going to spend about the next 10 minutes 
um, in prayer. And I love it. It goes along with that song. It says when, when God moves, and, and, you know, he moves, and oftentimes the catalyst for that is our prayers. I mean, think of that. Think of that. What we say, how we speak to him, actually makes a cosmic difference. And I don't understand it. I don't get that. But yet in the scriptures, it tells us that the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. So those who are in Christ, when we pray, somehow God works, somehow God moves. And I think it's one of the things that we neglect the most, that we just put aside. We don't spend time in it. And it's something that we need to get better at. As a matter of fact, the disciples, as they followed Jesus around, they asked him, they said, teach us to pray the way that you do. And I'm sure they saw him go off by himself. I'm sure they saw the power in his life where he would spend all night in prayer sometimes. And, uh, and they wanted that. So we're going to spend some time in that. And if you guys don't know, we've got a program called 12 by 12. And, and basically, you sign up for it. If you're interested in this and not on it, then I would go to the reflection room after the service. But they send out just um, 12 things a month. And you can decide to pray at noon or at midnight for five minutes for all night if you want. Um, but it gets us in the habit of, of praying. And, and again, when we pray, God works and moves. So we're going to just start off. And I, I just want you to get in, in this kind of mindset. And the first thing that we want to do is we want to adore God. So we just want to go to him and, and we want to worship him um, and tell him why. So this is almost like you're writing a love letter to the Father saying, I, I love you, I worship you, I adore you because of this. You were just, just, get, just singing back um, his attributes to him. So why don't you take a minute or so and go to God adoring him. You know, that's always a great way to start your prayers, just going to him and telling him who he is, his attributes, what he's done, all those things. And, and I think that sets our hearts right. And then the next point we can go to is, is you're going to go and you're going to confess your sins to, to God. You're going to tell him what you're sorry for, the, the mistakes that you've made. Ask him for forgiveness. So forgive me for, and you fill in the blanks for a few moments. So now we've adored God, we've confessed our sins to God, and, and now we want to go and just, just with a list of the things that you're grateful for. What, what, what are you thankful for in your life, good and bad?
So the last three or four minutes have kind of set the stage. So we've adored God. We've confessed our sins to God. We've been thankful for who he is, for what he's done in our lives. And now you can go to him with your list because God's for you. He cares for you. Go to him with whatever's on your heart, where you need his help, with situations that you're confused by, whatever that is. Spend a minute or two on that. So that was a quick little model of prayer. We had adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication, the acts of prayer. Now we're going to move on because God's for you, but he's also for others. So we're going to take some time, pray for people in your lives, whether it's family, friends, coworkers, bosses, neighbors, uh, those who need salvation, who need the free gift uh, of of grace that, that God offers through Jesus Christ. Take some time of whoever comes into your mind and pray for their, for their salvation. I'd like to pray for for God's peace to multiply. Maybe it starts in your own heart and your own family and moves on. Scriptures tell us in Philippians that let your gentleness be evident to all. Let the peace, the calm, and the storm be be evident to all. So it starts with you, moves to the maybe whatever places of influence you have all the way out through this, this nation and this world. So for God's peace. Now, someone that you know that is sick, that needs God's healing and needs his calm in the midst of of those physical situations or mental situations.
want to pray for people that are traveling, your vacations and, and staycations, that they're restful and renew your spirit and those around you. Pray for our first responders, police officers, those who come onto the scene of accidents, firemen, people in our military. Pray for those for a few moments. You can put up the next two, but we want to pray for the, the street that you live on, that you actually impact your neighbors, that there's just a, a, a spirit of unity around there and, and kind of friendship. And also for, for our region, for the city of St. Louis, for the, the surrounding areas, and then for our nation as a whole. Pray for those. And then finally, pray for our church, specifically for our youth programs this summer. We're going to be leaving for camp in a couple weeks. We've got 200 people going down. Pray for safety, that God works on hearts, that, that, that situations are taken care of and healed. Pray for all of us as leaders that we reflect the light of Christ. Father in heaven, you have no limits. Um, and I think that what we did over these last 10, 11, 12 minutes might have been the most powerful 10 minutes of our week. Just hundreds of people united in, in, in praying to you and asking for your help and giving you glory and honor. So Father, our hearts are prepared now to worship one more time uh, this morning as we sing. So help us all just to realize your goodness, your greatness, the love that you have for all of us and for those that we come into contact with every single day. Thank you that you answer prayer, that you are a God who works and acts. You are our friend. Amen. Let's stand up and let it rip.
Good morning. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. Has it been good to be here so far this morning? Yes. Awesome. Well, my name is Laura. Welcome to Oak Bridge. Hi, I'm Tyson. Welcome to Oak Bridge. Uh, so if you're a guest here with us today, we'd like to say welcome. We are so glad that you're spending your Sunday morning here with us. Um, we have a few important announcements that are just for guests. Um, first off, if you could stop by after service at our information center and pick up a new guest brochure, um, we'd love to meet you and tell you a little bit about our church. If you haven't noticed already, it's a little bit different than other traditional churches. So um, we'd love to tell you a little bit about our church. And also inside, there's two free coupons that you can have, one for a free drink from our cafe and one for a free t-shirt that you can pick up at the connect us. So make sure you check that out. Um, also, if you'll get us, or if you're a guest, you'll notice that we don't take an offering in this service, um, and that's by design. We just want you to sit back, relax, let this service be our gift to you, um, and really just open up your hearts and minds to what God has you here for today. Um, but if you do call Oak Bridge your home, there are joy boxes throughout the campus. Um, there's online giving and text giving, and we just know that um, God blesses those who give, so we ask that you give with a joyful heart. Um, lastly, you'll notice that we don't take communion in the service, but there's a room right behind us called the Reflection Room. You can go back. You can take communion. There's people in there that will pray with you as well, or you can just pray on your own. Um, we've had an awesome morning of prayer so far, so if you want to continue with that, um, head back to the Reflection Room after service, and you can do that. What do you got for us? Yeah, you pretty much said most of it. Um, no, but... Uh our summer programs for our youth ministry is in full swing right now. Uh, so one thing as a church we've asked you guys to do is if you guys want to bring in snacks, but you have to bring them in by next week. Uh, this is for our 200 plus people that are going down to big stuff. Uh, normally we give them snacks because they're on the bus for a long duration of time. Uh, so if you want to bring in snacks for big stuff, uh, bring those in by next week. What kind of snacks do the kids like? What kind of snacks? Yeah. I don't know, just like youth snacks. 
<laughs> like anything from like chips, yeah. cheeses, granola bars, non-perishable items that you think kids would like. Maybe nothing with too much sugar, just because you know we have to be on the bus with them for right. a really long time. So. Well, I'm hesitant to even give away snacks because let's be honest. So I ride the seventh, eighth, ninth grade bus. Like those kids stomp snacks into the floor like it's their job. <laughs> so. Um, I don't let them, yeah, I don't let them get off the bus till they clean it. So it's <laughs> disgusting. But, uh, also speaking of food and speaking of the commitment that our church has to our community, the Arnold food pantry has asked Oak Bridge, uh, to partner with them and bring in non-perishable food items, canned and boxed food. So if you guys want to do that and help our community that, uh, our church is planted in, uh, the Arnold food pantry is in need, is in your need. Um, so if you guys want to bring in cans or box goods, all you'll do is you'll bring them in and then you'll put them behind your car. And then our parking lot team or the obturns um, will come by and they will pick those food um, items up in the parking lot next week. So again, that's next week. If you guys want, if it's on your hearts, get canned foods or box goods. And then all you have to do is keep them in the bags that you buy them in um, or you know, collect them from your pantry, and then the um, church will be around to bring them in. So don't bring them in here. Put them outside your car in the parking lot. Awesome. Um, also, this summer we have for the little kiddos VBS coming up. That's about a month away from today. So if you're interested in helping out with that, we're still looking for volunteers. Um, it is a Sunday night through Wednesday night is who we need volunteers for. I think it's July 22nd through the 25th. Um, so if that's something that you feel like you could help with, please text VBS or sorry, text volunteer to our church phone number. That's in your bulletin. And then if you want your kiddo to come to VBS, we'd love to have them. This is a great opportunity to get kids plugged into the church. Church, um, and get their families excited to come as well. And they can text VBS to the church phone number. So if you want to volunteer, text volunteer. If you want to have your kid go, text VBS. Lastly, we got books for sale, summer reading program. Here we go. Oh. So the first one we have is um, present over perfect, right? Who doesn't need a little bit more? a little bit more of being present in their lives over being perfect. Um, and this book is normally 20, 23. 23. I was going to say 24. Either way, right? It's on sale for $10, which Pastor Tom wanted me to emphasize. Such a good deal, right? So um, such a good deal. 24, regular 10. Or 23, whichever. Or 23, right? Um, Buy it now and it's 10. Who knows? Uh, but secondly, this is a book written by one of my favorite pastors, um, Tim Keller. I'm going to be honest. I haven't read this book. This is a prequel uh, to uh, one of his first books that I've read. Um, but this is Tim Keller, Making Sense of God. So this was uh, the second book that was on the New York Times bestseller uh, that he wrote. Um, but this was actually a prequel to the first book. So if you haven't read the first one, Great. Read this one, then read that one. Um, but this is Tim Keller. This one's 27 on sale for 10. So even better. Even better deal. Um, it's kind of big, so uh, be prepared to read it. You know. Here you go. Making right. sense of God. All right. Do we have any other other verse? I think that's it. Okay. Well, Tom has an important announcement. He wants to come up and tell us. So all eyes on Tom. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren Tyson. Give them a round of applause. I don't know if being uh, announcers is good for the marriage. They go home and critique one, of, one another, I'm sure. I, I want to tell you guys, look, the church is just not in this room. It goes out from this building. We, we come here to learn about God so we can go out. And all the announcements that you have are really to help you do that. So you guys can step in here and then step out and do some other things. With all that said, I want to tell you something that's going to happen July 7th. When you guys came in, you, you guys got a sheet of paper that said, For Your Neighbor Ideas. July 7th, not next week, the week after that. We're not having church. We're not gathering together on Sunday morning here or at Oak Bridge City. So if you're watching online, you can tune in, but uh, there's not going to be anybody here. And what we're asking you to do is that morning on Sunday, sometime between 9 o'clock and 1 o'clock, for you to do one of these things on this list for your neighbor. So our vision is to have 3,000 people do something for a neighbor, and then you send in during the week to information at oakbridgecc.com <coughs> about excuse me, what you did or an impact it had. So you guys hearing me? Real simple. You can buy a four shirt and you can give them a four shirt and you can say, you can explain why. God's for you, I'm for you. You're my neighbor. You can go through this whole list, a plate of brownies. Anybody, this should be a round of applause right now. You should be fired up about thinking about this. 
And here's kind of where it comes out of is I think it's something that Jesus would do. But I have a neighbor that I've prayed for, I've thought through, I'm nice to occasionally, all right? But I'm never nice intentionally. You know, if he's outside and I see him on this one, I'm being nice intentionally. I'm going to get him a four shirt, I'm going to give him some brownies, and I'm going to tell him that I'm for him. And actually, I'm going to tell him this, as weird as it seems to say, I'm going to say, Leo, I love you, and I care about you, and I pray about you. You can do the same thing, and I'm going to guess that God's going to use that to change us in a good way. Amen? All right. Everybody going to do it? Yes or no? All right. So July 7th, where will you be? At your neighbor's. You will not be here, all right? And if you say also why we're doing it, we have a group of people going down to big stuff. There's a lot of leaders down there. So we're asking everybody to do this and to send in what your responses are and to pray about the people. Can we do this? Quick word of prayer. Father, just help us uh, for this day to be a holy day that uh, goes without, outside of these walls. God, I praise you and I thank you for all you've done and all you will do. It's in the mighty name of your son, Jesus, that I pray. Amen. Stand up for a quick second and say hello to somebody around you and say, this is the neighbor I'm thinking of. Take a seat. Well, good morning, and I wanted to welcome everybody at Oak Bridge City. Love you guys and thinking of you, and everybody online, just uh, love the community that's growing there. Uh, welcome, and the people out in the foyer and the hallways here in this building, there's always got a community out there. Uh, today, I'm going to give you kind of a shorter message, and uh, I was actually going to Stop this message after the first about 15 minutes and say, okay, we're done, and we're going to walk out of here. I'm going to give you a little bit more, but not much more than that. I'm going to kind of tell you a story, and it's kind of about this box. And uh, it's all the idea of being about four, that God's for us, but he's for a lot of things, and he's, uh, this is what it's going to talk about. So this box, here's where it came from. My mom and dad recently perished. In fact, it was, uh, they died uh, did, Herc, did you know his dad's birthday like the other day? Is Herc still in here or is he gone? Okay, died. That's right. I, I'll pick another one. Excuse me. He had a coin collection. So you know when your, your parents die, um, you go through all their belongings and all their stuff. So uh, we went through it and I saw this up in his closet. And I had taken some of these coins when I was a little kid and I'd put them in plastic sleeves from my mom and dad. And, uh, but here's kind of what it was kind of weird. So when we got this coin collection, we got it home. Uh, I'm going to take some stuff out of here for you real quick. This was filled with a lot of coins. Like uh, these, I think, are here all buffalo nickels. And some of these are from 18, late 1800s. This is a 1927 S. I thought about selling these to all you guys afterwards to remember this service and I was going to charge you each about a dollar for each one of these. Not a bad deal, huh? Brought them to the coin collector. They're worth 13 cents each. I would have made 87 cents more selling to you guys for a dollar. But uh, when we went through this whole list, uh, I brought everything home, and we're checking its values, and there's some really old coins. My, my dad has some old coins in there, and I don't know if they're, they're really worth much, but we came across this little box, and Katie and... Uh, looked at it, my wife looked at it, and I wasn't aware of it. They found it stuffed somewhere in the corner of this box. And this box, by the way, was in my mom and dad's closet, far away, hidden in underneath stuff. And uh, so I get a phone call. This was like three weeks ago. And Katie uh, and, and Kathy are, are somewhat excited, and they said, you, Tom, you need to come home. Uh, we've got some uh, information for you. Well, you know, when you hear that, your mind goes through a bunch of things and so forth. And, and I figured they wouldn't call unless it's something uh, fairly good. So uh, we came home, I came home, and they said, I want to show you something. And they had three coins. And the primary one I want to show you, talk about, is this one right here. And uh, here's just a, a little research on it. It's called the Ephraim uh, Brasher Doubloon. The Ephraim Brasher Doubloon. And the date on this coin was, I think, roughly 18, 1787. 
Now that's an old coin. And uh, so Katie's doing the research on the internet and it has EB, which was from Ephraim Brasher on it. It marks, had all the markings that was right and this little EB was a special marking. And they only had uh, seven of these in existence. He was the next door neighbor to George Washington. Remember our country was founded in 1776. This was one of the first minting of coins for the, uh, uh, you know, the new nation. And so we looked this up on the internet and it, the last one had sold about 10 years ago for between 4.5 and 5 million. Yeah, nice little uh, phone call uh, to get. And um, then Katie said, there's two other coins that are in there that, that uh, your dad had. And these are two Mormon coins from the time of Joseph Smith. And these are $10 gold pieces. And each one of them, uh, for the Mormons, is precious because they only have like 30 of them from him. And each one of those is worth about 400 to 500,000 each. So a total of about $6 million worth of coins. The only problem was, was uh, it didn't add up in my mind. So, and what I meant by that was, was if my dad had something that was such a treasure, so valuable, why would he have not have told us about it? Why would he not have, have shared that with his family? Why would he have hid it in a box in the corner of a closet, never to be talked about? I mean, that just doesn't make sense. Does that make sense to anybody that you've got a treasure and, you know, and, it, and I'm thinking, you know, he, he could have used that for whatever he wanted to use it for, but certainly it should have been uh, shared so it didn't add up. And, and yet every place we looked, it had all the markings that this thing needed and uh, uh, to be authentic and real. So Katie and, and Kathy were, were, were excited, and uh, you know, I was excited. We handled the greed really well, all right, uh, just so you know. Uh, we, we, we weren't going to you know, walk away from church or anything and uh, you know, all this kind of stuff. And I said, look, the next day, we'll go get it authentic, uh, authenticated, whatever word you want to use on it, at Midwest Coin. So we get up the next day, and I, told, I called Katie that night at midnight. I said, Katie, I said, just so you know, I said, this is not real. I, I, I think it, 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 it can't be. And I said, the only way you can make it if it's real in your mind is if God dropped it down in heaven. My mom and dad died here. I'll put this there. They'll never know about it. Fine. One of those deals. And I said, this is, it just can't be real. There's got to be some things missing and, and so forth. We brought this packet into the coin collector and uh, brought it in just like this and set it on the table. And he goes, not real. Not, didn't, look, looked at it right there, it's not real. I, I said, this is the Brasher doubloon. There's only seven of these. And he goes, yeah, there's only seven, and you don't have one of them. All right. <laughs> these are $10 Mormon coins. They're gold coins. And he says, well, let me tell you, they're not gold. And they're not worth anything, zero. Because they're fakes. And uh, so, you know, we returned the Corvette and, you know, the Lake Lot. <laughs> But I, you know what, I, you know, I, I, I knew that my parents cared about me, that I knew that if they had this treasure, they would have shared it. You don't take a treasure and you don't hide it, you don't bury it, you don't, you share it with other people. That's what you do. And uh, by the way, I did ask him how much he'd give me for this and he said he wouldn't give anything. And I said, well, how, how did these get in circulation? He said... There was a grocery store that printed them at one time and gave them away as giveaways. Good little fake for me. He got me for a while. <laughs> he said it was a long time ago. He said, they're in strictly, we can't put it back out there, obviously, since it's, it's counterfeit. Now, um, I only tell you this all the way. And Herc, that was the pimp that was going to ruin. I was going to put this back in the box, tell all of our family, hey, go through some of the coins. There's too many for me to go through. You guys go through them. Now, I was going to have Herc give me a call. We're millionaires. My sister, Billy Joe, my older brother, Steve, all these kind of things. So I ruined it right now by this. But here's the point. Nobody has a real treasure that they value and hides it. Do they? Does anybody do that? Something that's that valuable? No. How are you with Jesus? I mean, is Jesus really your treasure or is he a fake treasure? I mean, is he, is he worth everything? Or is he just counterfeit? See, Jesus is for the real treasure. I, I could have made this message and walked out of here. So now that's where you've got to think about it. 
But I didn't, I didn't want to do that to you. I want to tell you why, why at times we treat the treasure of Christ, the treasure of the kingdom of heaven, as if it doesn't make anything. And I think there's an evil in this involved. Later in the fall, I'm going to talk about Satan for about four weeks so we can be more wise to the, the one who's a deceiver. Matthew tells us a story uh, about Jesus, and he gives us a history, a record of some things that happened to Jesus. And, and I find that this pattern of three things I'm going to share with you is a pattern that you'll find in all your lives. And it's a pattern that makes us take our faith and either bury it or make it really not real. It makes us not really treasure Jesus. It makes us put other things above him that, you know, aren't that much above him, shouldn't be. So here's the pattern I'm going to tell you about. Jesus was about 30 years of age. And he had come and he had a mom and a dad, I think lived a fairly normal life, as normal as it could be uh, with what his mom and dad knew about him. And at age 30, he publicly decides this is the time that he's going to come and declare that he came to redeem a people that were alienated from God because of our sin. We were separated from God. And he comes to say, look, I'm that one. And then he comes also to live three more years after this to show us how a human, we as humans, can understand God more. Now, we can't fully understand him because of our humanity. But he says, I'm going to come as a human so, so you can understand how I love, how I forgive, how you should do it, how things work, how we protect, how, how life can be changed, how you can have more wisdom. And we see this in Jesus. But here's the start of this. So he comes down from a mountainside, and this guy named John, who's called the baptizer, he knew who Jesus was. He knew about him. And he sees him coming down. And uh, he had been saying, prepare the way because there's one coming uh, that is greater than I. And he's talking about this Jesus. So I guess John would probably think of this point in time period, is this the time where Jesus is now going to step up and step out and reveal who he is, the son of the living God? So he comes and he's baptized by John. And you can read about it in Matthew 3. But I'm going to pick up right after he's baptized. Jesus is baptized in this river Jordan and it read Matthew 3, 16 through 17. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Can you imagine that? The people heard that as Jesus was baptized, he comes up out of the water, clouds part, Heaven opens up and you hear a booming voice of God saying, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Baptism is always tied in with identification. He's identified. So when you're baptized, you're publicly identified as the son or daughter of Christ, of the living Christ. And it's a big deal. Jesus did it. It wasn't to remove sin. He had no sin. It wasn't to repent of something. He had nothing to repent of. It was for identification. But it's a big deal. It's a big deal. So the first thing that Matthew tells us this is the pattern is. It's for Christians. Now, if you're not a Christian, you can sit on the sideline on this one. But pay attention if you're a Christian. And if you're not a Christian, pay attention. It's good to learn about this as well. All right? So when you step out fully into your faith, you are identified as a follower of who? If, normally, time if you ask a question in church, even if you don't know the answer, the answer is almost always Jesus. Let's try it again. And you're normally a follower of who? That's right. That's what you are, meaning I follow Jesus. I follow Jesus and I forgive. I follow Jesus on how I love. I follow Jesus on what I value. And I learn that as I go along. I don't have all the answers right now, but I'm learning that. And I'm trying to apply things. That's why the mission statement of our church is to make followers of Jesus who in turn become followers, who make followers of Jesus. It's to follow Jesus. And you can do that at age 15. You can do that at age 85. You can still learn. So here, he's identified. That's step one. Well, then Matthew 4, uh, 8 through 11. We're just going to jump down a little bit, and here's what happens. So after Jesus publicly steps out and says, I, I'm identified as God's son, and this is who I am, and he's stepping out, it says that he's taken away into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights to be tempted. And he's got some, 
major weakness brought into his life physically and emotionally. And uh, so one pattern almost always is when you identify as a Christian, almost not just for the first time, but almost any time you publicly or you stand up for Christ, this temptation will come next. There will be something from the evil one that will want to knock you off the path that you're on, almost always. So we read in, in Matthew 4, 8 through 11. Jesus is being tempted by the devil, however that looked. All right? And you know what your devil is that tempts you, however that looks. Here's what we read. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Now, I don't have this in my notes, but I'm just going to tell you this. People say, why do bad things happen in this world? Because this world is not of God yet. This is of the evil one. When you say, why do bad things happen in this world? For whatever reason, God's allowed Satan right now to say, you've got dominion over this earth. Someday he's going to take it back, and this won't happen. But right now, so a lot of times we blame God for bad things. I think we're blaming the wrong person. I think God can redeem bad things. Anyway, he said, all, he said, all the kingdoms and their splendor, he says, I'll give this all to you if you'll just bow down and worship me. You can have everything. You can have the Corvette. You can have the person. You can have the power. You can have the popularity. It's all yours. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now, I want you to understand this. Jesus was weakened right now. He was hurting emotionally, physically. He was down. And he says, away from me. He says, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. Here's the point. What if when Satan said, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kings of the world and their splendor, and he says, all this I will give you if you will bet down and worship me. And Jesus said, got it, done. You're my treasure. The world's my treasure. Power, popularity, that's my treasure. My comfort's my treasure. What would have happened if Jesus would have said that? Well, I'm going to show you in a second what I think would have been lost, the greater treasure, the real treasure. Right here, at this point, when you're tempted, by what? By the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. That's when we walk away from Jesus and we hide him. You know, during the summer, I really just were geared in so tightly as a church on our students. And there's so many of them that have done so many great things and continue to do great things. But then there's, there's a certain percentage that, man, they're on fire. They're identified with Christ. They, they, they feel the pleasure of God when what they do, they, they've got purpose. They've got hope. They get it. I mean, they know it. They know who he is. They know the treasure they have. They know his value. And then all of a sudden... Kingdoms of the world and the splendor step into their picture. And the boyfriend becomes more important than my savior. <clears throat> Popularity <clears throat> from a fraternity or sorority fitting in becomes more important than my treasure of Jesus. And we put another God over our treasure. And our light dims, things change. And we don't even identify hardly anymore, really, as a follower. And I believe maybe that's the story for many of you in here or watching online or Oak Bridge City. And maybe that's why you're back here today. You say, yeah, I've, I've done that. I've, I've taken and hidden the treasure from my family and my friends. I think Jesus understands that. And I think today's your day to maybe recalibrate, maybe re-add up, maybe re reevaluate what's your treasure. And God already knows what you're valuing in your heart. So let me jump down a little bit further in Matthew 4, 17. Jesus doesn't put anything above God. He worships the Lord. He says, I'm going to serve him. It's what, that's, that's my true treasure. Matthew 4, 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach. And here's what he said. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. He says, in other words, turn towards God. Come back to God. Hey, you had a tough freshman year at college. You went away, you broke some of your own moral boundaries, not to mention the boundaries of God. And God says, just turn back towards me. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to restore you, to, to bring you back to the center, to, to have your treasure 
becomes something of value again that's real, not temporary. That's more valuable than stuff that will rust. That's more valuable than relationships that oftentimes will disappoint you. Even if they're the best ones at times, there's hardship in them. He said, I offer you this. He says, I want you to have the kingdom of heaven now and experience it fully someday when you stand before God. So I read that. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, turn back to God, focus on God. For the kingdom of heaven has come near. Jesus says, I've come to bring that kingdom down. And I'm going to do it through my followers. So I said, what's, what's the kingdom of heaven? And I started writing this morning, and I had to stop because I ran out of time. But I'm going to give you a list of maybe 20 things that, that is more valuable, is a greater treasure than people, is a greater treasure than stuff. It's your God. It's your relationship with your Father. Here's some of the things that I wrote about the kingdom of heaven. You're reconciled to God. You're okay with him. No matter what you've done, because of what Jesus has done in your faith, you're okay with him. No matter what you've allowed happen to your body, something in your body, somebody you've hurt, you've been part of, you're okay. The kingdom of heaven, that treasure, God has reconciled you with the creator, the one who loves you and knows you most and will never, ever abandon you or leave you or forsake you. You're okay. You've been reconciled to God. You've been saved from the wrath of God. The day we stand before him without the covering of Christ, his wrath, his righteous judgment, you've been saved from that. You've been spared from that. You're free from condemnation. When people try and condemn you, God says, I do not. That takes precedence over anything anyone else says. You're adopted into God's family. You're his treasured son and daughter. You're a citizen, eventually, of heaven. Can you imagine that? An actual place, a citizen, a place that's, that's far greater than any kingdom on this earth, any place on this earth. You're a citizen there. You have access directly to God through prayer, just as we experienced today. He hears your prayers and they're powerful and effective. He hears your prayers and they're powerful and effective for those around you, your children and your children's children. What a treasure that is to know we can impact our children by what we ask of God because the kingdom of heaven is brought forth because of Jesus. You're partners with Jesus. He's your friend. You've been given the Holy Spirit, a guide inside, a moral compass that if you listen to and hone in on can guide you and help you. You've been saved from the darkness and brought into light. You've received truth, not fake news, on whatever station you want to pick. Not information that we can't figure out. You've received the truth of God says who you are and who I am. You've received grace upon grace. And that barrel has no bottom. No matter how many times you mess up, God's grace is bigger than that. You've received peace in spite of circumstances. I know some of you are going through some tough times and you can't explain that you have a peace through it except it is the most greatest treasure that God's given, a peace that comes with the kingdom of heaven. You have an ability to forgive. There's people that say, I wish I could just forgive that person. And I've seen people in Christ because of the kingdom of heaven forgive people that have done heinous things to them or other people. You've been given depth of love. You know how to love. I am. Uh, Experienced that gift a bit yesterday. I have put my grandkids to a movie, and the movie was a good movie, but it was for my six-year-old grandson who's very compassionate. It brought him to tears quite a few times. It was, it was killing me. You know how those Disney movies will kill you? And I'm thinking, gosh, I got to pull him out of here. He's just, you know, torture for an hour and 20 minutes. And I, I didn't guard his heart, all right? And I, I want him to stick around because the Disney movies always end up where the good guy wins, right? But I thought about as I see him sitting there, tears running down his face, how much I love him. Because I start to understand how much Jesus loves me, right? If the world could get that idea, what a treasure we have. We get to celebrate kindness and generosity. And we get to honor humility. We get to honor it. Raise it up for those that are humble, not power. Raise it up for those that are humble. We get to apply self-control. 
when we've not had some in that situation. We get a soul satisfaction that those outside of Christ cannot understand when I said, my soul is good, my soul is good. And we get a community that experiences closeness at a different level. That's treasure. Isn't that better than a car? Isn't that better than a feeling if somebody gives you a hug now and then? And those things are great. I'm not knocking them. But isn't that the treasure that we have? Isn't it amen? Is it not? That's the treasure that we're talking about. The pattern is almost always the same. You're identified. You're tempted. And then your treasure is either revealed or you bury it to take a lesser treasure. You you take the $4.5 million coin and you take a 13-cent buffalo head nickel. And God says, no, worship and serve him first. And he says, all these other things I'll give to you. Only they'll be richer, they'll be better, they'll be stronger. You won't need stuff that you thought you needed. Jesus is for treasure. He's just for the real treasure. So really here's what I'm asking you to do. You all agreed if this coin was the real deal and if it was worth four to five million and there was only seven of them and George Washington had touched all seven, he said, your dad would have never hid that from you, Tom. If it was real treasure. He would have told you about it. He would have shared it with you. Do you believe Jesus and his kingdom is real treasure? And maybe you need to pull it out of the box. Maybe you need to wear a t-shirt. Maybe you need to give a t-shirt to a neighbor. Or bring him a snack. Or a gift card. Maybe you need to cut yourself some slack and say, I, I've been tempted. And I'm not as good as Jesus, but his grace is offered to me again and I can jump back into this thing. That's really the whole message today. And that's really the message of Christ. And that's the message of our church. Follow Jesus. If he's your treasure, share it with people. Not in a wacko way. Not shouting from a street corner. But in a way that's just natural to you. In a way that has some wisdom to it. Uh, Jesus is so for us. He's so for us. He wants you to have the real treasure. His kingdom of heaven. He says, I want you to experience it now. I want you to be partakers of it and sharers of it. And when you get to heaven, you'll get it all fully. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you that we can identify this pattern that Satan has always put in. We're identified publicly through baptism or through just decisions that we make later on where we say, I'm for Jesus. And then temptation will come, some form, some other treasure will try to be elevated above us following you, Father, us trusting you us keeping you at center. And then we'll either bury the treasure, you, or we'll put something else in front. God, may it be such that we remember this message today, that we remember that Jesus is for real treasure, and the real treasure is him and the kingdom that he allows us to bring in and be part of. God, I thank you for this time. Praise your name. Help this song that we sing next to be glorifying to you. And all God's people said, amen. Let's sing to the one who loves us and is here.
Say a couple parting things as we uh, exit this morning. Great to be here this morning. Seriously, been good. Let's say this Brasher doubloon was the eighth one. George Washington touched it. It was minted. Should that still be my treasure? Or shouldn't it be Jesus in the kingdom of heaven? The abundance of love, of grace, of truth, mercy, kindness, changing my heart, healing my heart when no things can do it, when no doctor can do it. Isn't that critical? That's, that's what I'm asking this morning. Jesus is for a real treasure. He says, I'm your treasure and you're mine. Jesus says, you are Jesus' treasure and he is ours. That is what the world needs to hear. I was thinking this week, this next week I get to travel with a bunch of students to Chicago. And I thought about, this is the first time I think I heard where there's like six generations that are living in our nation right now fully, from, you know, baby, the greatest generation ever down to Generation Z. And I've been praying for Generation Z and the millennials. That's the Generation Z is, I think, kids that are like 17 and down. Because that generation has to treasure Jesus so my grandsons can know Jesus. Do you understand that? You have to treasure Jesus because you have to reach the generation that's not yet named behind you. The only way to do that is to understand that he is valuable and he is worth everything. God, just thank you. 
for all the people here that have been a light to so many. All of you that are watching online, all Oak Bridge City, dear God, I thank you. May we continue to understand that when anything jumps in front of the real treasure, it's just fake. It's just not right. And let's put you back where you belong. God, we love you and we'll trust you. It's in your son's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. See you guys next week.